Hey, my name is Katie and this is my channel, Is It Just Me? And I had started, I did a video yesterday and I started it with talking about uh, credit cards uh, and how they get their money. Like how does the $10,000 or $5,000 or whatever that they issue the average American, where does that money come from? And to summarize what I basically covered in the last video was it comes from basically them manufacturing it. So the money is not backed by anything that is on that credit card. They just decide to give you that money and the money that they actually make and the value that is actually brought from that is you when you pay your interest rate and you pay the fees attached to this credit card. That is the actual money. The rest of it is basically just made up and helps like basically enslave the average American. But it led me down these series of questions and those are the series of questions um, that I'm still continuing to answer in today's video. And so some of the, uh, basically some of the questions that I'm addressing today um, from the last video that kind of left me going down more rabbit holes was I wanted to, to talk about who gives the banks the power to make up this money. Um, and then what is the difference between the basically where the money comes from, the two entities attached to being able to make up money and what um, benefits the government in doing this, in my opinion, and what I have seen. So let me start from the very beginning and just get into it. I'm going to try to make this a little shorter than uh, yesterday's, but we'll see. So the question I ask is who gives the banks the power, right? This is what ChatGPT tells me. Banks get the power to create money through a combination of government regulations, central bank policies, and the structure of modern banking system. Here's a breakdown of where this power comes from. One, central banks and government regulations. Legal framework. Government gives banks the legal authority to create money in form of credit through laws and regulations. Central banks, like the Federal Reserve of the United States, oversees and regulates the banking system which is a fiat currency system where the money is not backed by physical assets like gold, but by the government's authority and the public's trust in the system. As I went down these different researches, the things that keep coming up um, when it comes to a lot of money printing, whether it is public banks or whether it is the federal government and the central banks and all of that, it, it all comes down to government authority and it all comes down to the fact that the average American believes in this system, right? The belief. If we no longer believe um, in the money that they make out of thin air, then it no longer is anything because no one believes in it, right? So <clears throat> to continue on, central banks are responsible for issuing the physical currency, which is fiat, it's not physical, managing and overseeing the money supply and they also allow commercial banks to create the money through lending <sighs> fractional reserve banking so this is really interesting because chat gpt says that one of the ways that the money is basically produced or what it is kind of backed by a small percentage i'll go into fractional reserve banking how it works the modern banking system operates on a principle called fractional reserve banking which allows banks to lend out of portion, lend out a portion of deposits they hold. When banks lend money, they don't lend out the physical cash. Instead, they create new deposits in borrowers' accounts, effectively increasing the total amount of money in the system. When a bank lends, it keeps only a fraction of deposits in reserve, a percentage mandated by regulators, and they lend out the rest. For example, if you deposit $1,000, the bank might keep 100 in reserve, assuming a 10% reserve requirement, assuming there is a requirement, and lend out 900 to someone else. That 900 is deposited into another bank, which then can be let out at 90, lent out at 90% of that deposit. This process repeats, creating new money in the form of credit. So over and over and over again, but it usually, <laughs> it used to start, right? It started by a fractional reserve, so a certain percentage. Before COVID, it was, I believe, 10% reserve, which again, still allowed them to just continue to build off of that. When COVID hit, COVID, I always say that with an E and it drives my family nuts, but with a D, to say it correctly, um, 
March of 2020, we came off fractional reserve. So the banks, well, we were getting stimulus to scrape by. They, there was a lot of things that were happening behind the scenes and fractional reserve banking no longer exists as of March of 2020. It's been four and a half years and it still has not been put in place, which regardless, there was still a lot of money creation even when there was a fractional reserve, but imagine there not even being any now. And we wonder why inflation has just tremendously climbed. Anyways, let me just stay on point here. The role of central banks, monetary policy. Central banks have the authority to set key economic policies, including interest rates and reserve requirements. There is none for reserve requirements for commercial banks. By adjusting these policies, they control how money, how much money banks can create. For instance, by lowering interest rate, central banks make borrowing cheaper, which encourages, encourages lending and increases the money supply. So I'm sure we're all aware, but the Fed reduced interest rates by 0 0.50. And it's always under the premise that they're trying to help the average American. Um, I'm not so sure. This is another way to basically stimulate the economy and continue to print. And continued printing only does not help our inflational issues that we are seeing here on the ground level as an average American. And I'm sure in every country, right? Uh, so public trust and confidence. Again, let's go back to this. Backed by trust. The ability of banks to create money is ultimately based on public trust in the system. Fiat money has no intrinsic value. Zero. It's valuable because people believe that others will accept it as a payment for goods and services. This trust is upheld by governments and central banks, which guarantee the value of money through regulatory frameworks. Government backing, governments back up the banking system through mechanisms like deposit insurance, the FDIC in the US, ensuring that even if a bank fails, people deposits are protected. It helps maintain this confidence in the banking system. So to summarize that, it goes off of our belief and it goes off of the fact that they allow these banks to print whatever they want. And then when they overprint and they get themselves in a situation where people need the money or, you know, they, the government says it's insured. So then they're going to replace it with more printing. That's the regulation. So bad behavior basically generates more bad behavior, which is then absorbed by the consumer, us, the average American that is working and supplying the true value, which is labor, which is what gives everything value to begin with. And we get to pay the difference. We get to make up this difference that they've created. Again, I guess my opinion, but I'm pretty sure that no one's really gonna dispute that on this level. So conclusion. Banks of this section, conclusion on this section, banks are guaranteed the power to create money primarily by the federal league, by the legal frameworks established by governments and the policies of central banks. This is done within a regulatory system that aims to balance the needs, economic growth, financial stability, and public trust. So basically this all comes back to the government, which the government is the one that puts the central... Anyways, I'm going to get into more of that. Let me just keep moving on. Um, however, it also brings risks. And when poorly managed, as seen in a financial crisis, the consequences can serve... the Can be severe to the broader population. What is the difference between the central bank and the government, right? So they keep wanting to reference it almost like two different things. Um... They, they sales pitch it really good here. So bear with me. Um, so my question is, what is the difference between central banks and the government? Isn't the central bank part of the government? The relationship between a central bank and the government can be complex, probably too complex for us average people. And while they are connected, they serve distinct roles or have different levels of independence, depending on the country. Here's a breakdown of the key differences of their relationship. The central bank is responsible for monetary policy. This includes controlling the money supply, setting interest rates, and managing inflation. Central banks oversee the stability of the financial system, regulate banks, and act as a lender of last resort for commercial banks during crisis, financial crisis of their creating. 
They also manage the country's foreign currency reserves and may issue the national currency. Government, so that's what the central bank says, government, the government specifically, the ex the executive and leg legislative branches is responsible for fiscal policy. This involves government spending, taxation, and borrowing. The government uses fiscal policy to influence economic growth, redistribution of wealth, and fund public services. Education. I don't know about you, but I can't even believe that one of the examples as far as fund public services the first one they reference is education, which to me is like, I don't know if any of you have been in any of our public schools or your kids are seeing the fact that there's a lot of money going there. There is not. Here in Washington, there has been cuts on kids' activities. There's been cutbacks on teachers. Um, there's a lot more supplies that are being um, expected from parents than, um, and, you know, originally. So they definitely aren't, all this money printing and all this deficit that we are doing has not gone into our schools on any level. I know a lot of it is going overseas and a lot of it is going in big corporation pockets. Um, so independence of the central bank. In many countries, the central bank is designed to be independent from direct government control. This is done to prevent political interference in monetary supplies, which could policy, which could lead to short-term political motivated decisions like printing money to fund government deficits, which could cause hyperinflation. Hmm. Why independence matters. Central banks often focus on long-term economic stability, maintaining low inflation and stable currency, while governments may focus on short-term goals, especially around elections. Independent central banks help prevent manipulation of monetary policy for political gain. Example, in the U.S., the Federal Reserve operates independently of Congress and the President in its day-to-day -day operations. Though, its chair is appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate. Let me read this. So, they're saying that basically... They stay separate, these two things, the central bank and the government do not operate in one unity. However, the only way that you become part of the Fed or the central bank, or whatever you want to throw in there, is if you are appointed by the president and voted in by the Senate. So, like all jobs, don't you work for the people that hire you? I'm pretty sure you do. So how are the members of the central bank hired and paid? Appointed of cent the appointment of central bank leaders. The key members of central banks, such as the chairperson or governor of the board of governors, are usually appointed by the government. Federal Reserve United States, chair of the Federal Reserve, the president of the United States nominates the chair of the Federal Reserve and the nomination is confirmed by the U.S. Senate. And the term lasts four years and the chair can be reappointed multiple times. So they are completely separate, right? But I'm just confused. So they're separate, but the but our president and our government senators, they vote them in and then they can continue to sit there and say, hey, you can stay in office. Huh, it doesn't sound to me like it's too separate to me. But um, I almost feel like if that was the case, shouldn't they run and be voted in by the people? Um, again, my opinion. Board of Governors. The Federal Reserve Board of Governors consists of seven members of whom are nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate. They serve 14-year terms to ensure, to ensure consistency and reduce political influence. I don't know about you, but I would think the longer you're in that chair and the more you're commingling with, I don't know, to me, it seems like there would be a lot of mingling, but that's just me. Regional bank presidents. The head of the 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks are chosen by the prospective board of directors, but the appointment must be approved by the Board of Governors of Washington, D.C. Regional bank presidents. So... When I, the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C. is the Federal Reserve. It's the same way of saying they're voted in by the Federal Reserve. Regional bank presidents are voted in by the Federal Reserve. So again, everybody's just intertwined, right? 
I'm not really seeing the division that they're talking about between government and any banking situation. So um, the second part of my question was how central bank officials are paid. Compensation. The salaries of central bank officials, including governors and board members, are typically set by the central bank itself, but most, but, mu but must often align with public sector norms. Federal Reserve U.S. The salaries for the Federal Reserve Chair and Board of Governors are set by Congress, for example, of the recent figures. Are set by Congress. Here are the recent figures. The Chair of the Federal Reserve, currently Jerome Powell, who just did the 0.5 reduction in interest rates, right? Earns around only 203,500 per year. The board of governor members earn slightly less, around 183,100 annually. These figures are generally lower than what top executives earn in the private sector. Those central bank jobs offer influence and prestige. Hmm. Kind of interesting, right? So these jobs are significantly lower than what they could be getting paid. I wonder why. Now it says it does offer influence and prestige. Hmm. I wonder why they would want these jobs. It seems like a lot of stress for not as much money as they could be making if they were in the private sector. Conclusion. Central bank officials are typically appointed by the government, but with safeguard in place to maintain the central bank's independence, their pay is usually lower than top sec sector executives. So if Jerome Paul only makes 203500 then why when you ask Google, and this is literally, I couldn't find a current number for Jerome Paul, but based on public filings as of 2019, Jerome Powell's net worth was estimated to be a range between 20 to $55 million. And this was like five years ago. So I would be really interested to know what he's making now. So I still didn't really understand. So I'm like, are central bank members paid by taxes? Like, how are they paid, right? That's how much they get paid. What, you know, what funds that, right? Which we all know it is us. But let me just go down into detail about what this says. While taxpayers do not directly pay central bank salaries, there is an indirect connection. Government bonds, central banks buy and hold government bonds, and the interest paid on those bonds comes from the government, which is funded by taxes. However, but it's funded by taxes. Everything originates like with taxes. I mean, well, technically, because taxes is the only thing of well value because we're working, we're doing labor, we're producing, and they tax. Anyways, so, um, Monitor the central bank's activities such as controlling inflation, interest rates, and stabilizing the economy directly affect the broader economy, which in turn impacts government finances and tax revenue. But this is more of an indirect influence, not a direct cost to taxpayers. They're basically hustling. Um, in times of crisis, in some cr cases, especially during financial crisis, central banks may require additional capital from the government, and by extension, it would be the taxpayer. To stabilize the economy, this can happen if the central bank incurs significant losses, but such situations are so rare. Most of the time, central banks are designed to be self-sustaining. Yeah, because they can make as much money as they want. Like you can make as many screw-ups as you want if you can just say, hey, here's the money. Could you imagine waking up and just saying, hey, I want the tree outside my house to be able to make as much money as I need for the day. Um, so yeah, they are rare. Uh, to them by what they're seeing because they are able to print. Central bank official salaries are not directly funded by taxpayers. Rather, they are paid out of the central bank's own revenues, which come from its financial activities. While there is an indirect connection to government finances, central banks are generally self-funded and operate independently from taxpayers' money. In fact, most central banks return any profits they make back to the government just shuffle back and forth um so my next question was does this help government officials get wealthy yes the financial system including how money and credit are created can and often does contribute to the wealth of government officials though not always directly there are several ways that government officials may benefit financially from the broader system either legally or through unethical practices here are some key points that explain how this happens Insider knowledge and investments. This is number one. So, uh, privileged information. Government officials, especially those involved in economic policy, like central banks 
officials or lawmakers who oversee financial regulations often have access to insider information about upcoming decisions to or changes in monetary policy, interest rates, and regulation. They may be able to use this knowledge to make investments in stocks, bonds, or real estate that will benefit from those decisions. Stock market investments. Many government officials own stocks or have personal investments. If they know ahead of time that the central bank will lower interest rates, which tends to boost stock markets, they might invest in certain stock sectors. While this is supposed to be regulated and there are laws against insider trading, loopholes and conflicts of interest can allow for legal but ethically questionable behavior. Real estate. Similarly, similarly government officials who know about infrastructure projects like new zoning laws or changes in economic policy might invest in real estate in areas that will appreciate in value as a result of those changes. Lobbying or corporate influence. Revolving door. A common phenomenon is the revolving door between government pos po government positions and the private sector, particularly in the finance and banking industries. Officials who make decisions regulating the bank industry often leave their government jobs to take lucrative positions at banks, hedge funds, or consulting firms, capitalizing on the knowledge and connections they have gained in government. Again, just kind of goes back to government and connections and them just kind of doing their own thing while we sit here trying to survive. And then most of us don't even have time to ask questions or do research or look into things because we literally are on average living paycheck to paycheck. Um, I mean, I could go on. There's so many pages and different opportunities, lobbying, corporate influence. They have access to low cost borrowing. Um, they have access to the monetary policy and um, asset appreciation. I mean, it's uh, tax loopholes, special exemptions, corruption and bribery, post-government wealth accumulation, um, consulting and speaking fees, uh, broad positions and advisory roles because you got to stay calm, you know, buddy, buddy with their buddies. Con um, there's conflict of interest. I'm going to just, there's, I mean, pages of just different things on how they can navigate and make more money in government. So yes, their salaries can be low because that's not where they're making all their money. It's kind of like athletes, like endorsements, you know, athletes get their money from playing sports, but there's also a lot of endorsements that they can receive if they have, you know, good management, but, um, they don't get it created out of nowhere. Right. Um, these people, these people do. Um, and it really starts with us voting in the office and then not asking questions and literally feeling like we need to have more government to tell us what to do. Um, I was someone who was, uh, I guess I would say more on the democratic side. Uh, my grandfather was, my mom was always pretty like, you know, kind of voted based off of who the candidate was. My dad kind of too, they were both kind of open, but you know, I really bought into the Obama and I, you know, as a female, I looked at it was like, you know, how can I vote Republican? And I'm a gay female. So I had it like, I really bought into the belief that Republicans, you know, were typically white, you know, older white males. Uh, and that, you know, having Republican in office would cost me my rights and I work full time and I have medical benefits that I offer my spouse. And for me, whether you're religious or not, I, this basically is, was my thing was that I felt that as long as I worked and I paid taxes, I should have the same rights. And I wanted to be able to provide medical benefits and stuff like that for my spouse, just like the person next to me. Now with everything happening, um, it has caused me to be a little bit more open. Now, do I think the Republican party is the right answer? No, I'm really independent. I'm for the people. I think the people need to get involved and that we need to become informed and we need to become aware, which is why I spend so much time just like troubleshooting and looking at both sides. We do not need more government. What government we do have, we need to be selective on and we need to be informed on. And then we also need to make sure that us, the people hold them accountable. Um, so they don't go into all these bad behaviors and find ways to make themselves wealthy while they take from us. In conclusion, the financial system and the policies that govern it can create opportunities for government officials to accumulate wealth, both directly and indirectly. While many of these practices are legal, they often raise questions about fairness, conflicts of interest, and the influence of wealth and power on public policy. Some officials may engage in unethical or corrupt behavior to enrich themselves 
while others simply benefit from the system that disproportionately rewards those with insider knowledge, access to capital, and connections in the banking and financial system uh, sectors. Ultimately, the overlap between financial power and government decision making can lead to incre increase inequality and reinforce the notion that the system works better for those in position of power than for ordinary people. And I'm going to leave it there because it is on us to get informed and continue to learn and to build community within ourselves and strength within ourselves. It's not about being mean to one another. It's not about having these debates that really we shouldn't even be focused on some of these issues. It's not about the things that divide us. It's about the things that unite us. And we all want to be able to feed our kids and we're all freaking struggling and living paycheck to paycheck. So I appreciate anybody that listened to this. There'll be more videos to come on whatever thing gets stuck in my crawl. Take care and have a good day.